This is Overcoming Performance Christianity, the podcast that leads you on a path to freedom in your walk with Christ. If you're a longtime Christian, but something's missing in your relationship with God, then you might be caught up in what I call performing for the Lord or performance Christianity. So we dive into this in this episode of Overcoming Performance Christianity. My name is John Fugler, and I'm on the road from performance to relationship in my walk with Christ. And I'm taking you with me again this time, helping you gain freedom from the bondage of performance Christianity. This podcast does that. I'm a lifelong Christian media guy, a husband, a father, a grandfather of nine. More about that in a moment. Uh, I'm also the CEO of Fresh Faith 24-7, where we lead you on a path to freedom in your walk with Christ. And check out my free trial, by the way, at freshfaith247.com. You can take it for a test drive, experiencing all the benefits and resources. Again, it's freshfaith247.com. Hey, you ready to get to know Jesus? Paul said, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's our anchor verse, Philippians 3.8. This is the podcast for high-performing Christians. And in this episode, my guest lets us take a look into his life and how time, faith, and consistency helps him get to know Jesus. Uh, I I made five knowing Jesus statements to him and had him comment on each one. First time I've ever done that before in an interview, I didn't lead with a question. And uh, you're going to get a chance to meet him shortly. We had a, a great time together mentioned I got nine grandchildren and I just talked with my son before I pulled up here to the microphone on the phone and I heard a lot of people in the background and I said what's uh, boy what's going on a lot of little people I should say and he said well I'm helping some neighbors and friends with uh, I, I think he's had three other kids that they've they've gotten he was entertaining them I think he took him to the zoo or something today and uh, yeah he said just uh, you're just hearing eight kids running around <laughs> They got six of their own, and so they're having a grand time. And then uh, you say, well, okay, and I got on here to talk to you. So just thought I'd, I'd share that. And, and I got up to the microphone, and my chair just started sliding down slower and slower and slower. So the pneumatic uh, thing in here isn't working, and I end up almost looking up to my microphone. But, uh, you know, that, that's a first world problem, right? No big deal. We're here and we're going to have a good time together today as uh, we look at this thing about knowing Christ. And first, uh, I want you to take my spiritual self-assessment. If you haven't already, a lot of people have done that. Find out how you're doing in your relationship with God. Uh, you might know already. But this will get you uh, more specific information. I developed this spiritual self-assessment that will give you some answers about your the health of your relationship with Christ. It just takes three minutes to go through this, and it includes some probing questions that will give you the honest truth about your relationship with Jesus. So go ahead and take it now. It's free. Go to my website, freshfaith247.com, or click the link in the show notes. Highlighting a date here, I mentioned it last time, June 7th. That's when my new book comes out. And thanks to many of you who have helped me with the title. I put out some possibilities to my email list yesterday and got a lot of votes that are helping me narrow it down. I'm going to try this again. I'm going to put it on social media, too, as I want to get it right. Got a subtitle. I got to run by you, too. Now, my, my cover designer is dying to get started. But I need to finalize the title first. Uh, I'll keep you informed all along the way as I work this out. And I'll ask for your help again. Uh, The topic of the book is how to move from performance to relationship in your Christian life. That might be a good subtitle, but I'm looking for a title to that. (laughs) This podcast deals with that very topic, but you'll have it all in one place in my book. So coming up June 7th. And my, my focus in this episode of the podcast, which is episode number 40, we're up to 40 now. Season number two, and I got uh, 40 episodes under my belt, and the focus is the same as last time. It's how to know Christ. I guess you could call it part two. Uh, And our guest is going to share his thoughts and how this really plays out in his life. But before we get there, I want to build on what we talked about last time in our last episode. Uh, We said that most of life happens between trials, and I'm thankful for that. I hope you are too. But 
as we get to know Jesus more deeply, not just know him on a surface level, but really know Jesus, how can we know him as if we're in the middle of a hardship? I mean, I say sometimes that Fresh Faith 24-7 is a movement of believers desperate to know Jesus. And when we're in a trial, we seem to be desperate to know Jesus. How can we be desperate to know Jesus all the time? That's the challenge. And what I want to share in this episode are, are four keys to that. Four keys to, you call how to know Christ, but to be desperate for Christ. It's really a foundation for knowing Christ. The things that we got to get right in order to have that that desire, that hunger, that thirst, that desperation to know Jesus. And I use the word desperate in a good way, a good way. I mean, uh, baseball season going to start real soon in spring training right now, and my Dodgers will be desperate for a win every day, and I'll be desperate for them to win every day. That's a good thing. We want to be desperate for a win. So this desperate word is something that is a positive spin on that. But I think there are four things that will help us in this, in having that desire, that desperation to know Jesus deeply. And I think the first one is a pure heart. It starts with a pure heart. And that begins with coming to Jesus. When you're battling through a trial, you're probably pretty honest with Jesus, aren't you? You don't hide anything. You are desperate. You pour out your heart. Uh, In the normal flow of life, that same transparency is needed if we're to know Christ deeply. Same transparency. So uh, a good introspection leads to a good cleansing and giving us a pure heart. Not that we should get into a confession frenzy, but we are sinful people and sin dwells in our heart. And we need to check our thoughts and our attitudes before Jesus. And I would just encourage you to do that. Uh, Think about the words you've spoken to others in the past few days. Uh, Think about the things you've done. How have you behaved? at home, with your, with your spouse, with your kids. Um, so in, in the presence of Jesus, run these things through your mind. Expose them to the Lord. And then admit your sin. Affirm Jesus' cleansing through confession. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So come to Jesus. That's a magnificent promise, you know. So we come to him. He purifies us. Then repent, turning away from the sin you confessed. Repentance isn't a simple action. No, we're we're pulled in by sin. So we have to intentionally turn away from it. It's a full 180 degrees in the opposite direction. It's not flipping. It's not just, okay, I repent and we move on. No, our heart needs to do an about face. So if we're serious about knowing Jesus, we need to be the real us. We need to be the real me. I need to be the real me. You need to be the real you. No hiding behind sin. So part of knowing Jesus will be the eradication of those sins in your life as much as it is possible on this side of heaven. And it's not a once and for all experience. We need to keep coming to Jesus. When sin creeps in, We can't be afraid to confess it to him. He's waiting with open arms. Picture your Savior waiting with open arms. And he wants a rich relationship with you even more than you do with him. So the first thing is a pure heart. And then secondly, if if we're going to be desperate to know Jesus, we need to receive his love. (laughs) We need to receive his love. Doesn't it bring joy to your heart when your children know that you love them? They come running to you when you walk in the door. I think of the eight kids are (laughs) at my my son's house now. He's he was helping his wife have some free time, I think, and he said, "I'll take the kids today, and all the neighbors' kids too." But um, I I mean, when he walks in the door, his kids they come running to him because they know how much he loves them. They crawl up on his lap and. Some of them might be too big for his lap, but they give him a big hug. And same for you. When your kids come to you, when they need help, they do come freely to you. Uh, Other times you joke around, you play games, you laugh together, cry together, all because they feel safe and free in your love. And we have a hard time sometimes receiving the love of Jesus. We hardly consider it. 
And it can be a major roadblock in knowing Christ. We're left with knowing about Christ, but not knowing him like Paul did, knowing him so deeply. And we need to receive the love of Jesus. As you might know, I often spend a half day with God. I got another one coming up next week. I am looking forward to it. No agenda, just a time to connect on a deeper level, uninterrupted by anything. I shield myself from my phone. Um, I isolate myself from the outside world. I do some prayer. I journal, Bible study, sometimes Christian music, part of my experience. It's so refreshing and purifying. I don't know what's going to happen next week, but I'm looking forward to it because I'm going to meet with Jesus. Uh, I, I was walking with a friend. Um, well, it was it was last year. He told me about a habit he has. He and his wife have, they, they invite their grandchildren for an overnight a couple times a month. And I'm envious because our closest grandchildren are 500 miles away. Uh, as I record this, I'm about to go to Colorado to see three of our grandchildren. So I'm looking forward to that. During the sleepover, uh, my, my friend's grandkids are, are loved on with chocolate chip cookies, a kids movie together, a variety of unplanned activities. And I'm sure they learn about Jesus too during the bedtime stories or dinner conversations. And these little ones are growing closer to their grandparents as every year goes by. They're getting to know them in the context of life. You know, phone calls and, and video chats are nice, but that doesn't cut it when it comes to knowing uh, our kids and our grandkids. Man, we gotta go, uh, we gotta go all in. And it's that face to face. And that's the same thing with Jesus. No long distance, but let's get face to face with Jesus as much as we can. So my question is, do you receive Jesus' love? Or is your relationship defined by prayer and Bible study alone. And we need to do that. We got to have prayer. We got to have Bible study. But I feel that's two-dimensional. They're vital in, in knowing Christ, prayer and Bible study, but there's so much more potential in the relationship. To make it full and complete and 3D, there needs to be informal time with your Savior. It's all about receiving his love. Just a couple more here I want to go through quickly, and then we'll get into our interview, which will illustrate, uh, I think, what I'm talking about here. And that is, the third one is love him. You know, you receive his love, well, love him. Are you loving Jesus? Are you loving Jesus merely by the things you do for him? Or are you loving Jesus by first investing time to be with him and to know him? Talked about investing time just a moment ago. And as I mentioned, Bible study is good. Serving a church is good. Obeying the word of God is essential. Li giving generously to the Lord's work, that's living out your faith. Feeding sheep by discipling or mentoring other believers is right in line with God's will. But don't get caught up in the performance trap. Your works can be evidence of your love, but they're not, at the, they're not the core of your love relationship with Jesus. It's so important. Your works can be evidence of your love, but they're not the core of your love relationship with Jesus. With a treasured relationship at the center, a whole new adventure with Jesus opens up. Your service for him takes on a fresh meaning. Your faith walk comes alive. Giving, serving, mentoring, and feeding is inspired by your love. Inspired by your love for Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And because you love Jesus, you'll discover your actions for him will deepen your love further. It, I guess it's like a cycle. Love Jesus and you'll know him more deeply. And then finally, the fourth thing that really sets the table for being desperate to know Jesus, and that is to live joyfully with him. I pass by the coffee station at the office where I, I work. It's a ministry called TWR, Trans World Radio. And I heard two coworkers laughing. Mm -hmm. They were laughing at the coffee station. Suddenly I stopped. I looked at them and I said, stop laughing. This is a Christian organization. Then I walked on with a kind of a sheepish grin. <laughs> and they looked at me like, are you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I was just making a point. I was just having fun with them. But as Christians, we often take our relationship with Jesus too seriously. We need to laugh with them. I'm sure the disciples and our Savior had a few outbursts of laughter together. Imagine all those times when, when those men didn't get Jesus' parables. 
Jesus probably chuckled when he explained the truth from three different angles until they finally got it. You know, like, okay, guys, you look confused. Let me unpack it in a different way. There was this farmer, <laughs> and he went on. Uh, when I was in grade school, lunch was my favorite class. I joined, yeah, you too, right? Uh, yeah, lunch was your favorite class and recess. And I, I joined all my friends as we, we shared our, our lives together and our sandwiches. Lots of stories, laughs, uh, boasting, bragging, noise, all this just a roar here until the principal walked in and then all the talking stopped. No more laughing. There was a hush over the entire room as he slowly walked past each table. And to this day, I, I don't know why silence reigned whenever he entered, but it always did. And too often we view Jesus as our principal. Silence is demanded. Laughing isn't allowed in his presence. Be quiet and eat. Uh, I'm sure my principal didn't want us to think or act that way, but Jesus doesn't want us to act that way today. So the point I'm making here is we can be too stilted in our relationship with Jesus. We live out the lordship part, honoring Jesus as master, but some people will have a hard time living out the love part. And once you understand how much Jesus loves you, your heart will be flooded with joy. You'll be like, you'll be like a kid with your hero, excited, laughing, talking, having fun together. Every moment with Jesus, we become a rich experience. So are you living joyfully with Jesus? If you aren't, you're missing out on a valuable dimension of your relationship with him. He's your friend, just like any other friendship. Fun and happiness, should they should abound. You really can't know him until you loosen up and enjoy him. So live joyfully with Jesus. So those four things lay in the foundation. So we have a, a desperation to know Jesus. We're desperate to know Jesus because we have a pure heart and we receive his love and we love him and we live joyfully with him. Oh, please do that. Live joyfully with Jesus. I'm convinced that as we have these foundations, in our relationship with Christ, we'll know him better and be more consistent in our walk with him. Uh, my guest in today's interview is all about consistency. So I want you to hear what he has to say. Well, I'm going home today. Yeah, my homeland, Rochester, New York, where I was born and raised. And man, that's where I came to know Christ too. Many moons ago, like 50 years. And my guest is actually on staff at a church that we looked up to in those days as one of the few biblical churches in that city. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's so cool. And to hear that uh, Peter Englert is a pastor there now, he's an adult ministries director. And Peter and I were introduced to each other through another friend, and he's got a podcast. And as we started talking, we realized we're kind of looking on the same the same thing here in our relationship with Christ, but he's coming at it from a different perspective at one who is a, a shepherd to many people. Uh, Peter, thank you for joining us on the podcast. John, it's always great to talk to a Brighton Baron. Now they're the Brighton Bruins uh, from there. I know. I was disappointed when I went back for our, our reunion. I'm going, what? wait a minute, who, who changed the sign? <laughs> These kids, they come up and they Graffiti that no, they just changed the name. And so I was a baron and I'm I'm proud of it. <laughs> so how long have you been in Rochester? Uh 10 years now. 10 years. Okay. Great. So you've had the opportunity to shovel snow. A lot of it. Mm -hmm. Heavy snow, wet snow. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I lived in Philadelphia for about seven years. And what people don't know about Philadelphia is the snow there, it probably snows as much or more but it sheets so like you can just wipe it off your car it stays colder in rochester for longer yeah. uh -huh. yeah i remember i remember hey uh as you uh we start the interview here i've got like five statements i want to make to you five statements uh and they're kind of your quotes but i want to hear you speak on each one of these as i was pulling this interview together and going well I just want to hear a little bit about each one because these sound like good topics to talk about when it comes to intimacy with Christ and our, our journey. So I'm going to get to that in just a moment, but you're also the host of a podcast, Why God Why? 
So let me ask first, why did you start a podcast? <laughs> Uh, so long story short, um, my friend, John, who's actually now my boss, it was one of those Starbucks moments that we were just, how do we reach more young adults? How do we connect in the church? And those magical words that come up, we should start a podcast. Mm -hmm. So in 2019, um, we went through a process. I owe our title to my friend, Dan DeRosier. Um, he's an executive pastor in a church in Pottstown, PA, but you know, he threw out why God, why? And then the tagline is um, responding to questions you don't feel comfortable asking in church. And God was really good to us because we started the podcast in 2019. Little did we know in 2020, there was a pandemic um, and a shutdown. And so, you know, we've been able to do over 200 episodes with questions that people have, great guests. And um, yeah, so that's where we are. Did you find that people had different questions during the pandemic and also because of the pandemic, was there a shift? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic was extremely difficult. Um, I think so between the pandemic, I think trying to do the community thing, but also I think the biggest episodes that we had during that time actually revolved around, you know, we had the issue of Daniel Prude and George Floyd and to bring individuals in, one of the podcasts I'm most proud of is we brought two mental health uh, counselors in, um, Joyce Wagner and Carl Binger, to just kind of respond to what we were going through in Rochester. And um, I, I just, it was a way to feel connected to the community and offer, a, a, I'd say, just a hopeful biblical and even just kind of a morning perspective of this is really a difficult time. Let's find people who can help us engage this well. Why God, why check it out in your favorite podcast app. Uh, Peter, you're at Brown Browncroft community church, uh, adult ministries director. Um, and so what's your passion? I mean, what, where do you really find is the core of what you do and love to do in ministry? I mean, I think you said this before, I love shepherding um, and I love preaching and teaching. And I think where that kind of goes with hosting a podcast too is like there was conversations I was having that I just wish I could record. And so to have people with various backgrounds to do that. And, you know, most of my job is small groups, but we're also, you know, we're doing church in the 21st century. So the in-person and digital feed each other. And so that's been, I don't want to say fun, but it, you know, it's become a necessary passion to figure out how do we minister in the 21st century using some of the old principles, but also innovating in a way to meet people where they are in the 21st century. Mm. I think putting a microphone in the in the middle of one of those small groups would make a good podcast, but <laughs> you'd probably get in trouble. Depends <laughs> those on are the which, real conversations, aren't they? <laughs> depends on which small group. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to play five statements, and I want to hear what you have to say about each of these. I'm curious, and I know our listeners will be too. So the first one is this, wrestling with a boring testimony. Yeah, you know, so I grew up in Binghamton, New York, not too far from Rochester, um, attended First Assembly of God in Binghamton, and then also Ross Cornish Christian Academy. And um, I think, like, you know, my parents believed day one, I was going to be a pastor, you know, I was like seven years old. And um, that's a whole long story. And, you know, I think what's hard in any faith tradition is it's kind of easier to explain the radical testimony. And then we throw the caveat, well, I wish I didn't have this testimony. But, you know, I also kind of think too, with having a boring testimony, there's things that I'm finding when I pastor that people take for granted that happened in their life. And so a lot of where I am now is, I hope my two daughters, Haley and Lucy, have boring testimonies. But I also realize too, they're, I would say there's a burden, but there are ways that you're engaging God. There are seasons and there are valleys. And so to help people kind of think through that in a different way, because just the way we're wired, we're wired for crazy stories. And sometimes God's faithfulness is seen mostly in boring stories. And when did you kind of have that turning point where you said, I'm glad I have a boring testimony. What was the, what was the change? 
you know, it, it was less about hearing someone else is kind of quote unquote radical testimony. I think it's more been shepherding and pastoring people that, you know, you have someone that loses their job or goes through cancer and they find someone that's like worse off than them. And you're trying to help them realize like, this is terrible and this is really, really hard. And, you know, when I say that multiple and multiple times, you know, it's helping people kind of own their story and stop comparing it. I think that that's kind of where, you know, as a pastor, you got to take your own advice. Hmm. Thou shall not covet somebody else's testimony. (laughs) (laughs) Hey man, that's a great (laughs) t-shirt. <laughs> well, okay, let's work on it. We'll go into this to, and together on this. We'll sell them on my podcast and on your podcast. We'll be, we'll be off and running here. Okay, now the, so uh, as a listener, I just want to let you know if you have a boring testimony, that's okay. And thank God for that, really, uh, the Lord's protection on you. Uh, second one, second statement that I want you to comment on finding the gospel is a process. Mm. Finding the gospel is a process. Yeah. My friend, Dave Hurtwick, uh, he's actually a pastor in Liverpool. You know, he, as a leader of, he was a denominational leader for the assemblies of God for youth pastors. And he just kept talking about the gospel and the way he talked about it really just resonated with me because as someone with a boring testimony, I think we can either take for granted or it becomes cold theology that's not practical and living in us. And so when I look back at my life, you know, I think that when you're in your teens and in high school, your faith can become so concrete about reading your Bible and praying. And I know that you have a super passion for this, but you know, I took a Romans class at the University of Valley Forge where I went to college and just the gospel became real. And even little things like God loves you for who you are, not what you do. And that's Mm -hmm. what challenges you to what you're doing. And I just think that we, we live in an air of lies that we need to almost like experience the truth of the gospel. And I don't think anybody graduates from that. Mm. Um, It's a long process. Cognitively, you can know, but sometimes deep in your soul, um, there's things that you believe about yourself, about other people and about God that it's constantly challenging. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And and going back to when that realization hit you uh, about the gospel, um, how did it, what was that? Uh, the turning point in your your mind and your attitude affected your soul and your spirit. I mean, what was the the light went on? I guess uh, what what happened? Yeah, you know. So it's definitely a longer process. But here's what I would say: if there was a moment, it was my last semester in college, and it was probably one of my most happiest seasons because I didn't feel the need to prove anything. I didn't feel the need to make anybody like me. Um, I I felt this real shift. Now, there's times now where I vacillate to working really hard, trying to produce, but there's a freedom. And I, I think that that's in a season of my life where I was kind of transitioning out of college. I think it was really important. And I think also, too, we experience the gospel in major seasons of our life. You know, when you take a new job, I think sometimes there's a danger in, I need to prove myself. I need to make myself look good. When you're leaving a job, there's almost this, you can breathe because you're at rest with what you've done. And, you know, I I think the good news of the gospel, it's not good advice as Tim Keller would say, but it's good news to be believed. Mm. And this is probably a terrible analogy. I'll let you push back on it, but <laughs> I can always um, edit it out. <laughs> you can always edit it out. You know, I talked to a lot of people about the gospel of trying to kind of understand it. And, you know, I, I've said this, I said, if you knew in 10 years, you were going to receive $10 million, how would that change your life? Um, and people answer that in a variety of different ways. Some of them say I'd quit my job today. Some of them say I'd quietly do my job. And, and I think the point is to get people to start thinking like, 
you have the presence of God. God wants to be around you. And if he knows the end of the story, if he's at work, I think it just changes the way we live today. So I hope no like theologian or something emails you, but it's trying to get people to live with this idea of faith that, that God is present and he's there. And sometimes we're working way too hard to prove ourselves. Oh, I'm with you on that. I really am. And I guess finding uh, the gospel is, is really experiencing the gospel is what you're talking about, that it's the, you're always finding something new in that relationship with Christ, something new in Jesus, something new about the good news, the gospel go deeper and deeper. I mean, we could just dig, dig, dig. Could we? Oh yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned you've got two girls. How old are they? Uh, Lucy is two. Uh, we call her the CEO. Um, <laughs> she is very, she has very strong opinions and, you know, we're hoping that God forms her into leadership. And then my daughter Haley is five. We call her the COO. She likes to say, Hey dad, um, you said that we were going to have breakfast for dinner two days from now. Do you have that under control? And, uh, <laughs> no. so, uh, it's, uh, it's a joy. Oh, wow. And so they're going to parent you. <laughs> they'll be the parents <laughs> someday I'll work for their company. And then, you know, my wife, Robin, uh, she's a mental health counselor. Mm. So, um, you know, we have quite, uh, quite the family dinners. If, if somebody's watching this clip on video, I'm sitting in our dining room where a lot of the magic happens. Oh, wow. And you've been married how long? Uh, going on 10 years. Okay. Oh, great. Great. Hitting that milestone. So I guess the dinner time conversations, you got to kind of screen what you're going to say with a two and five year old up. Oh, this one's not for the family. This one's for, <laughs> well, you know, just for your listeners, you know, we're, you know, Haley's getting to an age now where she can really understand spelling. And tonight we were like, Hey, do the girls want B R O W N I E S? <laughs> and she's like, Oh, I'd love a brownie. And so <laughs> anyways, Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. Question number three for Peter Englert. This has been fascinating already. This one you're going to love, a listener. Uh, find God in the wilderness. Find God in the wilderness. So I, um, I graduated from Valley Forge, and I went to Springfield, Missouri. Uh, I started going to the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, and my anticipation was I was going to go to seminary, there was going to be churches begging to hire me. I was going to start a podcast. I was going to write a book and some pastor was going to graciously bring me onto staff and help me succeed. Um, that pastor, um, that did not happen. Mm. Um, I went to Springfield, made some great friends. I was working at Evangel's cafeteria and it was really, really hard. Um, and just to go from like having a campus of people that loved you in Valley Forge. Um, but that's kind of where I met God. And I think if you hang out long enough with people that follow Jesus, you'll find about these wilderness seasons. Um, you know, the next wilderness season, I, I worked as an admissions counselor at Valley Forge. And those were wonderful times, made great friends. But, you know, I, I had kind of thought I was going to give up this idea of pastoring and in the wilderness, um, you know, you're going to college fairs and you're constantly asking people, you know, where do you see God taking you in the future? Where's your dreams? And I think the hardest thing was like, does anyone care about mine? Mm. Um, and then, you know, without going into the long story, you know, meeting my wife, getting married, moving to Rochester, um, you know, there's just been peaks and valleys and. I think you've probably had a ton of pastors and ministers on here that they can tell you like how difficult, you know, there's some great seasons, there's some tough seasons, and there's things you find in the wilderness that you won't find anywhere else. What uh, aspects or identities or character qualities of God did you find in those wilderness experiences? You know, I, I just think it's faithfulness. Um you know, God has a way of just bringing the right people to you. You know, when I was in Springfield, Missouri, you know, right now we're recording this during March Madness, probably the most loving thing that someone did there, there was a, a couple named Joe and Jen, they were older than me and they had a kid and 
they just like took me to Branson and we watched basketball games with their whole family. Mm. And um, I'm just reminded of what one of my professors used to say. He said, God has some really generous kids. And when you experience God's love through other people, and when you start seeing that, you know, it's in the wilderness that, you know, you kind of lose some of that identity. I needed to lose some of that pride. Mm. I needed to learn how to listen better. Um, I, I needed to learn how to see people better. Um, and that only happens when you experience that from other people. And God helps you see that sometimes his love is through other people. Mm, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Peter uh, gave me these topics that I could choose from to interview him on about your, his relationship with Christ. I'm picking all five because these are, I, I looked at all these, I want to know, I want to know the answer. So here's number four, embracing a circuitous path. Well, that's a tough word. Um, we're going to have a prize for the first person who can spell circuitous, circuitous path, path, embracing a circuitous path path say that five times real fast <laughs> yeah so I, I think this kind of goes back to uh i felt called to be a pastor when i was 13 and you know i was kind of you know there's gym rats then there's like church rats like there's you know these people that hang out at churches all the time <laughs> and you know that was me and i had some great youth pastors and senior pastors and people that invested in me. And like, I think when I graduated in eight, when I was 18, you know, thought was, well, Peter's going to be a pastor. He's going to be a youth pastor. And kind of, as I said before, you know, I went to seminary, I ended up taking a job back in Philadelphia at Valley Forge as an admissions counselor. I worked at a seminary and I sold cell phones and that was all before I became a pastor. Mm. I wouldn't have chosen that path for my life. Even now, if I knew what I was going to go through, I, I wouldn't choose that. Uh, but that's the path that God chose for me. And I think sometimes we just need to embrace that. Um, we need to embrace that God knows way more than we do. And I would just say this to any of our pastors or any of our friends that might be you know, pursuing ministry. I needed to work a nine to five job to understand what it's like to be nine to five. Mm -hmm. There are people that they leave Bible college or seminary and they go right to pastoring. And I just had some huge blind spots. Um, I'll, I'll never forget this. I, I was selling cell phones and somebody like took my sale and like, so what do you do? You're like the Christian <laughs> who like, you're about to lose money because this person took your sale. And my really, really good friend, Mike, who's in sales, he said, Peter, this is how you're going to handle it you know, you're going to go, you know, to this individual. And I just said to him, Hey, you know, I, I appreciate you taking care of that customer. Um, I, I look forward to next time. And like the person perked and it, it was kind of a way with grace and truth to kind of deal with that. And there's just some things that you need to learn when you're not working full-time for a church. Hmm. What, what was the gap in time be between when you graduated from seminary and went and started as a pastor. Yeah. So the gap, um, I, I didn't graduate from, uh, the assemblies of God theological seminary. Okay. I, gra I graduated from Valley Forge with a master's. So, uh, that was 2009. And then I started on staff at Brown Croft at 2014. So, wow. Yeah. It was about a <laughs> That's five, five years. years. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Okay. That's real. That's real life. Okay. Um, so I, I love this. You're getting a, a good behind the scenes look, a real conversation with a pastor here. And this is neat. So the fifth question is this learning to practice radical faithfulness, learning to practice radical faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start I think this is for everybody, you know, whether you work in the marketplace, nonprofit. Uh, when I went to Browncroft, if I'd give a verbal idea, it probably had a 10% chance of happening. People would listen to it. They'd be like, that's a bad idea. If I wrote the idea down on a Word document, just text, it had a 50% shot of getting through. Whoa. If I created a graphic 
Canva document, it would have a 90% chance of getting through. Now there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can talk about with that, you know, is it because of the graphics or something? But I think that whether you're a CEO, a pastor, people are ready to call your bluff. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. They're like, is this person, you know, is he or she really going to do what they say that they're going to do? And most of the time when it comes to faithfulness, um, it's a lot longer than you want. Let me give you a quick example. Every Friday during our small group semester, which runs from September to about June or Memorial Day, I send out an email every Friday. I've been doing that for 10 years now. Um, and I think what I'm noticing, just even with the open rates, is you know it's a 60% open rate standard procedures, like 20%. But there's a credibility that I've built because people know that every Friday they're going to get an email with their group guide to have that discussion with their small group. And people ask me, they're like, what's the most important thing you've done as pastor? It goes that email on Friday. Hmm. Is it because of the email? No, it's because there people nowadays are looking for radical faithfulness. You could argue that people have always been looking for radical faithfulness and that matters to the details of your life. Hmm. I love that. Oof. So wrestling with a boring testimony, finding the gospel as a process, find God in the wilderness, embracing a circuitous path, and learning to practice radical faithfulness. Those sound like um, like five anchors for your life. Would you say those are really core to who you are and the way you live life? Yeah. I mean, I look up to um, my pastor, his name was Ron Piedmont. And Ron served uh, at First Assembly God of Binghamton for 22 years. And the things that he did, it was the radical faithfulness. Mm. You know, every time we'd see someone out in public, even if they didn't attend the church, they'd be like, hey, pastor, thank you for visiting us in the hospital. Um, and, you know, even this week, probably the most powerful thing I've, I've gotten a chance to speak, you know, being on this podcast is huge probably the most important thing that I had an opportunity to do. I got called in to go to a hospital room. This woman was kind of barely coherent and her family member said, Hey, we want you to baptize her. And I asked her, you know, we were trying to talk and she was, wasn't really coherent. And I said, do you want to get baptized? And she said, yes. Hmm. And it was verbal. It was audible. I could hear it. You know, got a paper towel, put it in water, dipped the water over her head. And the next day I got the call from her, her family member who I was working with. And um, he said to me, she passed away. Hmm. And I think about those stories that most of our Christian life is lived in the quiet, ordinary, mundane day to day. Um, you know, and it, some might think that that's like, maybe a radical example, but, you know, even, you know, tonight, you know, as we're recording this podcast, you know, it's reading the Jesus storybook Bible with your kids. It's, you know, showing up on time, um, doing what you're saying. And God takes those little acts of faithfulness. And I, I think he does way more than we think. Peter, thanks for being with us. This has been a good time. Uh, if you'd like to listen to Peter's podcast, Why God Why, uh, I've listened to a couple episodes and some good questions there that uh, people are asking you. And and so, uh, yeah, check it out. Why God Why? Any um, uh, closing words as we head out here and let you go back to your kids and your wife? <laughs> sure. Well, you know, if it's okay, do you mind if I just pray to close? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't do know that. if he has to do that. So, yeah. God, I thank you for John, and I think about our podcast listeners, and um, you know, I just pray that if they're struggling or if they're discouraged or disappointed, and they're wondering, do you see their faithfulness? Um, I just pray that your presence would meet our listeners, whether they're listening to this a day after or even years after this comes out. I hope that they would sense that you love them, not because of what they can do, but because of who you are and who you're creating um, each of us to be. I pray this all in your name, the resurrection and life. Amen. Thanks again to Peter Englert. Uh, Wasn't that fascinating to hear about consistency in our walk with Christ? I hope you're encouraged through that. 
I, he was so honest and I, I, I had a few questions there, but man, just to talk about those five points, uh, I wanted to dig and he, he delivered for us. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter's life has so many lessons for us. If you want your life to be vibrant, uh, to be a consistent walk of faith, then I want to help you. Fresh Faith 24-7 is open. It's ready for you to take it for a test drive, uh, a free trial that'll get you inside and experience all the great benefits. And one of those benefits, and I've shared this before, is the Freedom Path Training inside Fresh Faith 24-7. It's truly focused on those who want to know Christ more intimately. And that's what we're all about here on this podcast and at Fresh Faith 24-7. So if that's you too, then I created this for you. It's a complete video training, includes a playbook so you can follow along and even take notes. There's four modules. That's just one aspect of what we offer inside Fresh Faith 24-7, filled with good content video content, audio content, written content. Uh, we've got community in there. We've got some live events together. So I would encourage you to check it out, freshfaith247.com. And make sure you tell your friends about Overcoming Performance Christianity, this podcast. Share this episode with some friends, give them the link and have them try it out and see if it has a, a ministry in their life. So thank you for doing that. Next episode, uh, knowing Christ requires diligence, not performance, but diligence. And what's the difference? Well, we're going to explore that next time when we get together on episode 41. Until then, God bless you, and we'll see you then.